Can we? Cool. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everybody. I am Abhi. Uh, and the topic that I thought we can discuss about today is how do we prioritize long-term holistic thinking versus short-term insights? Uh, and the reason I suggested this was because uh, I work for a company where we deal with getting large organizations to think about making positive environmental impact. And the challenge has always been that everyone's focusing on short-term quarterly results and it's very hard to get people to think long-term about the impact they're having on communities. And so, and I figured this is the same problem that's leading to climate change that we see today because everyone's focusing on this quarter's profits and not about how do we keep the city or the planet safe. Uh, so again, I am no authority by any means. I just thought we'd have a discussion. Please feel free to just push me out and come here and share your thoughts. Totally keen. Um, so I think just a bit of, I, I guess I can share a bit of my experience in the past couple of years working on this field and then we can jump in as we please. Um, so, sorry, where do I begin? Yes, uh, so typically what happens is when we approach large companies and pitch a project saying, uh, let's say you're an FMCG company, uh, a manufacturing goods company, uh, and if you want to reduce the amount of waste that you use in your packaging, uh, then from a uh, society's point of view, it's great because you have less waste, it's better for the planet. But from a company's point of view, they don't get to do branding, they have, they're concerned about their products, shelf life, etc. And so it's, it's a very hard sell to get them involved and get them on board into these projects. And what we inevitably end up doing is saying that, hey, you can actually drive your brand value because consumers these days are educated, they prefer more responsible companies and products over people who are trashing the planet. Hello. Uh, so if you do this, you can then communicate the story of how you're being a better company and use that to drive your profit. So at the end of the day, we still come back to the core notion of uh, being thinking long term is better for your profit line. But I'm just wondering if, I guess, if there is a way to do it better, if there is some other incentive structure that we can either as governments or as individuals develop to get large organizations particularly to uh, not forego short-term profit, but just think, have the long-term in mind while making decisions. So please, anybody who would like to share anything, please jump in, please stand up. I can think of two examples. Okay. Um, and it is, this is sort of the, the counter to the idea that governments are magically long-term decision-making. Mm -hmm. Governments are by and large on a four-year cycle. The two exceptions, big exceptions I'm aware of. Um, the US Navy is the world's largest consumer employer. It's a single organization, there's no one else on earth who uses as much oil as the Navy does. They've been worried about the climate impact and the strategic impact of being oil dependent for more than a decade. So despite mm -hmm. all the political stupidity, even what's just happened to the US, mm -hmm. the Navy has been for over a decade looking at, oh my God, how do we become less dependent upon oil to do what we're doing? And it turns out that to run ships electrically is hard. It's not impossible, it's just hard. But there's a whole bunch of other things that, that it maybe needs. But yeah, so the mere fact that you've got um, a stable structure that is somewhat immune to both commercial and electoral pressures uh, turns out to have been one of the places where a sort of credible uh, drive or an effective drive has come into being. Mm -hmm. And then the other is, is a commercial one, which is reinsurance. So reinsurance. Sorry, what? Reinsurance. Okay. Reinsurance. So. Um, hmm. Insurers, insurers. So it, most insurers are, if not actually selling retail, but at least retail level, uh, initiating policies for individual consumers or businesses to insure some risk. Uh, the insurer is pooling risk to some extent, but insurers need to lay off risk as well. So reinsurers are in the business of uh, insuring insurers. So okay. Swiss Re in general, we have two big ones. They have been pricing environmental risk also for more than a decade. And so I sort of, it's not the only solution problem, but I, I wonder enough about their motivations and whether that sort of filters up into broader commercial practice, that whether there is a path either to encourage it to occur or by regulatory fiat to cause it to occur or by other means for the long-term business risks that are associated with carbon emissions to be priced into actions which drive carbon emissions. Exactly. Can't quite see it, because most of it's an externality. Mm -hmm. In the Navy's case, it's just because they're huge. Mm -hmm. They've got an interest. Yeah. But they, in the, I sort of wonder whether there is some way for that to uh, affect no. at least businesses who are But I think that's exactly the point. Uh, so if you take like this pen, it's using a tube of plastic and it costs maybe a dollar, but if you take into account the actual environmental cost of it, it should cost ten dollars. And the moment you start factoring in the price of the environmental impact of the products, everything that we consume becomes way higher. And so 
I guess in some ways there is the threat that this is anti-poor because you're going to deprive those who most need the commodities of the commodities that they need to survive. Uh, bottled water, for example. Like, sure, if we had amazing public water all over the world, then we could like ban bottled water, but we can't do it because many rural communities depend on it at the price range that we currently have. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. Perhaps the reinsurance industry could help drive that push towards cutting the margins on these as, products. As you said, how do we help reinsurance? How do we? Fortunately, Swiss Re is looking. They've got their they've got innovation people, a reinsurer. It's got to be the stodgiest of all businesses. They're, they're basically very long term thinking, very very good at pricing risk, mm -hmm. and averse to taking on un, un, uh, inaccurately measured risk. So they, these are they're not risk averse per se. They're, they're accepting risk is their business, mm -hmm. but if they can't quantify it, then they won't touch it. So these are, in theory, the most conservative businesses on the planet. In practice. Uh, the retail insurers are. The retail insurers take no risks. Dot every guy, cross every T, mm -hmm. and make sure all the paperwork is back to back with the reinsurer, and we take no risks. So it turns out the reinsurers are actually round. They've got innovation people in most markets with much innovation occurring, including Singapore, mm -hmm. looking for startups. So if there is scope to do stuff that helps reinsurers price and insure, even at a retail level, mm -hmm. they'll spin out of the retail business and then sell it to one of their retail partners, mm -hmm. um, then yes, I can't yet point to how to use that, mm -hmm. but the, the opportunity is there, so we've got ways to structure. No, but then I guess taking that mindset of the reinsurer who is measuring not just profits but also the environment around you, how, would you, how do you get the, uh, for want of a better word, the annual report of the company to reflect the fact that our environmental cost is X and we need to factor that into our profit line and then you see that you're not making a profit, you're actually making a loss? I'm, I'm not certain that you do. You do. But I'm, pointing to, I'm pointing to the reinsurer and maybe examples as cases where they're not mm. motivated by a need to demonstrate environmental credentials. They are pricing in environmental damage mm -hmm. courses for actual organizational and or economic sustainability reasons. It's not and we are, uh, our marketing to environmental conscious consumers or our environmental conscious shareholders mm -hmm. should reflect this. It's straight out, if we don't do this, we will lose money. True. True. Or in the latest case, uh, we'll stop case. existing. Yeah, uh, not just stop existing, but we'll, we'll it would dramatically limit if they can't get oil without having to invade still more Middle East countries, uh, <laughs> 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 or drill in uh, the Arctic. <laughs> well, uh, but that, that's the trade-off. <laughs> yeah, and so it's not. It's, yeah, the idea that Iraq was invaded because the US sort of cheap on the oil is ridiculous, but um, <clears> it <throat> certainly factors into it that the US uh, state and, and and defense interests are much more strongly engaged when oil is, is on the table than when it's not. Mm -hmm. and so that, that, it's that sort of piece of it. Yeah, versus drilling the Arctic or successfully building the Keystone XL pipeline, because nobody wants to build a refinery. Refineries carry risks and costs that nobody wants to touch. Mm -hmm. So the reason for this ridiculous pipeline that crosses from Canada to Texas is because that's actually cheaper mm -hmm. than building a refinery in Canada. By the time you factor in the, the costs, the risks, and, and so the insurance and liability concerns. So I mean, some of it's there, but it's only there in the sort of we won't build more refineries because that's too dangerous. We'd rather build pipelines and, and trample the rights of indigenous people. So I, you know, it's not a perfect solution, but I would point out that the perspective of the Navy is not how do we look good to our consumers. Mm -hmm. It's how do we maintain our ability to be an effective military organisation. And right now, that means dependence upon. Middle East oil, and it means uh, destabilizing. It's a, ge it's a geopolitical. So, but then uh, again, please feel free to jump in. Just the fact that sorry, I'm getting carried on. No, uh, but, but I guess th the same question can then be applied to oil companies. So a Shell or an ExxonMobil can see that if oil is going to run out in 50 years' time, how do we stay relevant as a company at that point in time? And they should be pouring a lot of R&D money into renewables, but they won't because they have legacy structures and vested interests they are protect. Well, so keep funding oil. <laughs> So I think it's, it's not as straightforward as just finding an, an existential threat to your organization, but then finding it enough to push vested interest out and get in. Because I mean, everyone's long been saying that the private sector is going to be the magic bullet that solves it, like people will start jumping into renewables. And to some extent that is happening, but not nearly fast enough, I guess. I, um, since the world is run on capitalism, I think one way, good way is to get a stock exchange to put indices that, in, that indicate environmental wholeness or healthness mm -hmm. into the index and get people to buy it, buy that index. Yeah. So if that somehow 
you know, if you can see that it's in that as a result of people buying it, it rises, you know, um, I guess that will incentivize people to stay on that topic, you know, whatever company, since it's a public exchange, right? Mm. If you could get an index fund, an environmental index into the stock exchange that measures well, not just carbon. You know, carbon carbon trading will be one example, but it's it's a bit too narrow. You could widen the scope of it. So what you're saying is to make it economic. Yes, economic exactly. Economic incentive. Yes, and, and, and economic incentive. But uh, are there there are actually pollution credits being bought and sold right now? Are there? Yeah. In the United States, so that will actually factor into it. Yes, just exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so it actually does exist exactly. already. Sorry, pollution credits independent of carbon tax. They, they want the same way. One is a disincentive, one is an incentive, incentive. right? right. Okay, it's yeah. the flip side, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right, correct? Yeah. So, but both of them are market mechanisms. Yeah. That's what you're advocating, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. I think what you're saying, if I can paraphrase, yeah. it's is, a bit is too narrow. You, yeah, you, you, want to, you want to mix it together yeah. so that the stock price actually reflects what you're doing yeah. to the environment instead mm -hmm. of, you know. But it's just reflected in the company stock price, which takes the fact due to some extent yeah, pollution most credits. People, most people don't see that. So I agree. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. reported in the same way. But so the smart yeah. investors do, yeah. right? And if you want to be a good investor, yeah, the smart investor will figure that out. This is the dumb money mentality, essentially. And I guess what you're interested in is, is uh, on a mass scale. Mm -hmm. right? so Macro scale, essentially global. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the question is not what's the smart way to invest, but, but is there a sort of viable action that can be taken that will have the effect of reducing yeah. Environmental spoliation generally, but, but carbon in particular. Like that, that's the one. That's like, like how, how do we get to how do we get to critical mass when all of these changes start to happen? Is the question. Somebody's gonna well, that's what the <laughs> United Nations is for, right? <laughs> I mean, to some extent, I know there's been there's some work done at Kennedy School of Government, Robert Stevens, yeah. who's actually done it for the past 25, 30 years, mm -hmm. Pollu uh, pollution credits, essentially. But the problem is market rigging, right? It's a game. People are gaming the system in the I believe it's Europe some time back. So the problem is check the balances. There were attempts to do, you know, that sort of thing. Game the system, game the system. And how do you handle that? Because uh, a lot of European biodiesel was from Indonesian palm oil, if I remember correctly. Pardon me? A lot of the biodiesel sold in Europe was from the palm oil in Indonesia. Yeah, it's one of the, <laughs> the of What? But yes, really. Yeah. Because, hey, it's bio. It's, oh, it's, it's good, it's, it's green. It's green. 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 Asia, but it's bio. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime you market incentives, there'll be gaming. Mm -hmm. Pure and simple, right? Game theory. Yeah. I mean, it's just like a mass version of the prisoner's dilemma, game theory, where right. you're trying to get them to sort of cooperate. And yeah. how do you do that without religion, so to speak? You got, tra you got <laughs> tra <laughs> tra <laughs> of tragedy or the commons. More that, yeah, because IBD uh, right. actually is sensible over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. In this case, there's no. In IBD, you've got. You structure the incentives in such a way that. I don't think how to say it, but mm -hmm. uh, in a way it doesn't correctly describe. How do the pollution, do they have to the pollution credits factor? Do, are, do, are they being called futures in that sense? I don't remember the exact term they use. Yeah. But it's on the fancy, I remember that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's but like they, they market it essentially. Because you know there is something called a futures market, right? Mm -hmm. So if you could put those pollution credits or environment credits in the futures market, then that would again, you know, make the whole thing play. Hey, everybody's playing a game, right? So let them go play a game with that and see, see what you know. Mm -hmm. What's the outcome? What what kind of signal do you get? Mm -hmm. you know? But the problem with all of this is you don't have a global enforcement mechanism. Yeah, you don't have a global enforcement mechanism. All national, no, no, you don't even have a local enforcement. Agree, right. You know, local, oil, global. oil is entirely, or, yeah. or hydrocarbons are entirely different to all the other kinds of pollution. Sure. Right. So sulfides are the, the yeah. big success story, including here. Yeah, like, pay lower port fees if your ship burns only low solar fuel when it's in the port of Singapore. Mm -hmm. But the difference between hydrocarbons and sulfides is that sulfides are not a source of energy. Hydrocarbons right. are. The denominator for civilization is our ability to harness energy. So we, at the moment you're sort of putting credit systems in the way of burning hydrocarbons, you are essentially trying to wind civilization backwards. And that's, that, it, at that, when you're doing that, it's, at a, as a general rule, it's almost certainly cheaper to buy the displacement regulation than it is to trade the credits. So, so to jump into a tangent on driving civilizations backward, uh, like there's a lot of times where, I, where, at least in my line of work, I hear people talk about uh, it's 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 a relic of modernity that we have this mentality of like consume, consume, consume. But I actually think it's not in that I don't think humans a thousand years ago were any less, for want of a better word, 
consumerist or greedy as uh, than we are now. It just so happens that we have the tools to then actually have an impact on a global scale. Uh, and, and the and the example that I would give is uh, like when uh, Native American tribes were hunting bison, they would just push thousands of them off a cliff to consume, and that that's. No, and and the and the idea being that oh, you will always have bison, so why do we care? Similarly, we'll always have oceans, so why do we care if I throw pollution into it? But now we actually have enough plastic to have giant jars in the in the oceans, uh, and so I think it's actually a factor of smallness versus age. Uh, in that, I, I find that anytime you have smaller communities or smaller cities or like smaller organizations, it's easier to sort of get this long-term thinking. Perhaps because uh, there isn't as much cutthroat tendencies, per, per, so to speak. But the moment you have large organizations in large cities and large, large countries, you, it becomes harder to control. Cut for it. So it's certainly externalities. Yeah. The fact that it's, it's wherever the problem is, it's not me or my people I care about. Is the, it's enough to, to describe it without getting into uh, claims about the other guys being better for it. It's just, it's the bison. My, yeah. Yeah. As long as I'm getting my bison and the supply of bison is okay, what's the problem? Yeah. Yeah. Are you, what's, what's the question that you're asking? Are you interested in something that is like low level upward solution or? Uh, I'm looking at. I guess what is a small thing that we can do because I don't think we're ever going to have like a one an Alexandrian solution to this. We just need to start keep pushing from the ground, like the Alexandrian knot. Like you have a complex knot and he just cuts it. <laughs> no, so so the, the, the story is, uh, uh, I think it's in Macedonia where Alexander was coming by and there was a very complex knot that couldn't be removed and he said, I'm going to solve it and just took out a sword and sh sh cut it in two. You're talking about silver bullet. Yes. So silver bullet. And, and in, in, in Let me give you a modern day equivalent that y'all can relate to, right? Yeah. Diana Jones, remember? Come on, just shoot him. No, but... You know he had, he had the runs. Yes, I know. He was the act, like, Harrison had the runs. Yeah. He was like kind of just. He was two weeks, so he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, there was another example. Again, it's a bit metaphorical, so forgive me. But uh, the, where someone said, uh, "This is a, a TED talk on India and how do we build solutions for the Indian market?" Uh, where he said, "You can't have one solution that scales across the country because you have multiple language systems with different writing scripts and different cultures, etc." So. Uh, and in mythology, there is a story of a demon who would uh, multiply each time a drop of his blood touched the ground. So the more you attacked him, the more of him there would be. And the solution is to create a, a spirit that would consume all the blood before it hits the ground. So you can defeat him without spilling his blood, metaphorically speaking. But so to speak, I catch the carbon dioxide before it hits the atmosphere. Maybe. <laughs> so I guess, yeah, I don't know. Uh, what are, what are small things that we can all do to sort of keep? In our own spheres of influence, to keep pushing this. <laughs> Let, let's get LTA to stop taxing the Tesla car so much, and then. <laughs> <laughs> that's not. That's why they misunderstood. The yeah. Tesla Model S is not an efficient vehicle; it's a sports car. Mm. So LTA's position makes absolute sense. You, yeah. put, you put a Nissan Leaf on the road in Singapore, then, then you. I forget what words and how much, but like the amount of money involved is much, much smaller. Mm. The Tesla problem is that the Model S is a sports car. Now. Right. Mm. Um, so new models, new models there is coming up with the big problem. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's even less efficient. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Tesla is not showing the efficient vehicle now. Right. No, no, no. It's not connected. This might be one of Well, the things like the Nissan Leaf are already on the road in Singapore and they're much cheaper to run. So that that option already exists. If you want to put a car on the road in Singapore, it's cheaper. One of the options. Yeah, actually, I think that for Singapore situation, cars is not a good solution. No. Uh, mm -hmm. After all, we are a very small island. We are spending so much building roads, building all the infrastructure. We are destroying the environments to just build roads for cars. No matter Tesla, Leafs, or any other cars that's in the market, oh, public transport is, should be the best solution for us. Buses. Let's make it Solar City then. Let's make it but Solar City. To so but, but again, then it becomes a cultural problem because people are so vested in the idea of cars as status symbols as things. I mean, you already made that connection just now when yeah. I talk about consumerism. Yeah. Uh, unless you can change consumerism, I don't mean you can fix it. For instance, ask yourself, ask me if there were two things, then would I pay more for X you know, that, that would save the world? I think most people won't care. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, they, it's not even their lifetime. So. I mean, you know, so they, won't, they won't care unless they're a villager in coastal Bangladesh who now has to move because sea levels are rising. Yeah, but once those people move in, I'm sure they'll start <laughs> consuming as well. Because <laughs> this, this is our age, you know, I think it's, yeah. it's one of the problems of our age. So, 
Okay, again, metaphor, please forgive me, but I remember a story that I read a long time ago called Green Patches by Asimov, I think. And it talks about a planet where all the uh, living things are interconnected, where they can sort of directly feel everybody else. So you, you, when you ha perform an action, you're incentivized to think about the whole planet. So I guess in some way, how can we build a nervous system that connects us not just to each other, but also to the planet so that we, like if, if I buy a pen, I can immediately feel at some direct pain of like, oh my God, I'm buying plastic and I'm causing this much pain to this many people down the line. Wishful thinking, hugely wishful thinking. It's a huge Basically you're saying pain. It doesn't have to be a nervous system. Yeah, just pain, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and in some ways, we're feeling that Delhi has haze now, and Singapore has haze now, so people are feeling it, but they don't make the connection enough. Yeah, like, but how many people in Singapore has actually stopped using power? Yeah, you know, yeah. makes sense. No. Once it, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just one thing is, it could be a single state. Yeah. Mm. Is, there, is there a question, how do we get there? Yes, how do we get there? We just wait. <laughs> no, but let's see, uh, Asim, no, it, it's, like, it, it's, like, it's like training dogs, right? Like, if you don't want your dog to pee on the carpet, you have to stop him while he's peeing on the carpet. If you wait 10 minutes, then he'll not make... I think you're like the frog in that water is slowly <laughs> warming up. And, you know, there's no it's not about if we change a different <laughs> point of view. Yeah. Looking at what happened in the past that we actually, as a as humanity, did something about it. So mm. about the, the CFC ozone hole, yeah. right? So how... What happened that made the world come together to try to fix it and then actually fix it? But I think that's what Roland said. It's not a source of energy. So it's no, not vested interest. That's why it's not a source of energy. That's why it's not a source of energy. That's why everything that isn't a source of energy. Carbon, hydrocarbons are a source of energy. So if CFC is a source of energy, you think that the hole will be bigger now instead yes. of yes, 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 yes. But okay, but okay, but then spinning on that, uh, take plastics for example. They're a big consumer of hydrocarbons, but uh, I don't think there's nearly enough research going into alternative packaging that's better for the planet, even though it's not a source of energy it, because it's tied to oil. I yeah, I mean the the, the ocean gyres are a real concern, but the but we have the orders of magnitude between how we use hydrocarbons in, in products. And for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, that doesn't mean it's an unimportant problem, but it should be amenable to, uh, to economic forces if alternatives can be found. There are fighter plastics around, mm -hmm. it's not impossible, but mm -hmm. I, I don't know enough about the, maybe the science of yeah. find ways to package up consumer electronics in fighter plastics instead of um, fossil fuel plastics. Yes. Coming back to the market based solutions, what, mm -hmm. what happened to the carbon trading market? Yeah, it's, and every time it's the same thing, right? Whether yeah. it's taxing or cap and trade or whatever it is. Actually, if you, once you build it, it's cheaper for businesses to buy legislation and buy regulation than it is to comply. Sorry. And that, that includes buying a residency, that's what they call it. And uh, I think it won't work at all because uh, what are you going to do if uh, somebody exceeds their cap? I mean, are you going to invade? Are you going to find them? I don't know. I mean, it doesn't make sense. Oh, it, even if you assume it only within. Uh, cooperating countries, so exactly. rich countries, exactly. well, exactly. China, India. Um, go, right, that, that's the next problem uh, yeah, with that yeah. whole scheme. But even if you look at what happens within cooperating countries, yes, um, it's still going to be the case. You're seeing it in Australia, and you're seeing it. You will now see it in the US, where it is much more effective for business to compromise or corrupt the legislative and regulatory processes than it is to comply. And so that's you can't. This is, and it's it's act. There's a uh, sort of English. So why did that work for pollution credits? Why is pollution credits well, working? Because you can make, because there are economic revival the first one. Because there, you can make the transition without yes. undermining the economics of the situation. I see. Because the oil is still coming. That is not a word. Consumerism, right. economic, I think the only thing, the, the only people that can do is national level. Yeah. Right? As long as governments are gaining from consumerism, because that's what revenue you know, comes from, you're not going to. But, the, but I mean, do, so run, run that one to the end. Let us suppose that all the governments in the world, at least all government ones, agree and actually succeed in driving in their carbon emissions, which multiple climate emissions have been driven at. What happens in China and India? China and 
China is not stupid enough to do this. It's got a, it's bringing more people out of poverty in the world than the rest, every day than the rest of the world combined. It's not going to sign its own economic effort. Look at what happened in Copenhagen, where it carefully sabotaged the negotiations and then came out in public and announced that it was going to triple to the The words were divided by three, but the subsex was per unit GDP over the period they expected to win. So they, the, right, China's going out of its way to make sure it can continue to grow and grow its emissions and does not want to get stuck in a regulatory mess and will strongly avoid doing so. And India can't. It's not possible for the Indian government to tell a billion people, please stay poor. Please do not try to lift yourself out of poverty. They can't, they just can't. They don't have the strength to do it. So how is that? I think it's also more of a means of strength. strength. It, means, it means that if the rest of the world, apart from those two countries, agrees and, and implements cap and trade or any similar scheme, it won't make a difference. No, I think it's not an issue about strength of the country. Because if we are carbon trading based on, like, say, per person, how much a person is able to spend, then countries like India and China, they will actually have a lot of excess capacity. I think now is the, when they were negotiating for the plans, a lot of times they were talking about how much they are spending at the moment, which makes it that the situation is that the countries that are poor now are being kept in a situation where they cannot grow richer. Basically, India is stuck at that level. Whereas countries that are overspending, and, and in one way, Singapore is one of those that overspends by a lot. Well, I just got for people in the world. Correct. And, and, and we are still allowed to spend at the level that we are doing it, that, that because we but this were is, at this that is level. Right. If you, if you uh, attempt to move, if, if the whole developed world stop emitting carbon tomorrow, or, but but it's not about say or because you you are you are just putting some absolute number. No, 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 it no, could no, be no, some no, gradual no, change. No, yeah. If the entire affluent world stopped emitting hydrocarbons, you are putting an absolute number. You are saying absolute. Let's say tomorrow. You're going to say it makes no difference. I'm not understanding that. If the entire world stopped emitting carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere tomorrow. This can't happen, I agree with you. But suppose it did. It's not enough. Yeah, but, but there, we have to take this. Therefore, every intermediate uh, stage that you're talking about is even less not enough. That's the problem. We can't get there in the, the path that you're talking about, never ever gets us to work. Yeah, but going, going back to the pain, yeah, which is a good idea. How about everyone pays like 5% carbon tax annually? That's a pain, right? So I don't want to pay that. I'm making this suggestion, and it hurts me just saying it. <laughs> but but then we map that five percent to some measurement per country, and then you know the citizens can lobby the government to reduce that. You know, that's a discussion that you can have annually, right, up or down. So, so then you make some connection from that five percent to consumerism, purchasing, and what's important, and so on and so forth. Then maybe, maybe that's uh, that's one way. So I think we're running out of time. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. but I think on that note, I think it'll have to be staggered so that poor people pay less and rich people pay more, because otherwise the lower end viewer needs to. Yeah, those are details, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> those are details. <laughs> 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 you can figure it out. <laughs>